I'm Shepard Smith on CNBC, and this is the news. We are going to win four more great years in the White House. We're not putting on super spreaders. COVID and the great campaign divide. The concerned and those trying to move on. Two strategies with just eight days till the vote. Flames force thousands from their homes in California. And high winds make it worse. Al Roker reports the details of extreme weather. Stocks spiral, infection rates rise, hopes of stimulus relief fade. Could a double dip recession be right around the corner? Troubling, alarming, dire. The rural surge is real. People sick, frontline workers exhausted, hospitals forced to make tough decisions about medical care. Live from CNBC Global Headquarters, the facts, the truth, the news with Shepard Smith. Good evening. Eight days until the election and both candidates are targeting one must-win battleground state called Pennsylvania. Both were there today, President Trump holding three separate rallies in PA, while Joe Biden made an unannounced visit to his campaign field office outside Philly. Biden calling out the president's rally, saying it's not appropriate to hold events with massive crowds right now as COVID cases ride to unprecedented highs across the country. But President Trump insists we're rounding the corner on the pandemic, something scientists confirm is not true. Coronavirus fears rattling the markets today. The Dow plunged almost 1,000 points before closing off 650. We'll hear from Jim Cramer on that in a few minutes. Vice President Mike Pence moving forward with a campaign event in Minnesota, even after five of his aides tested positive for COVID-19 over the weekend. His spokeswoman says the VP tested negative this morning. On Capitol Hill, the Senate expected to confirm Judge Amy Coney Barrett within the next hour. President Trump says after that, he'll host a ceremony at the White House. So, a lot to cover. First to Kayla Tauschi following the Trump campaign. Kayla? Shep, it is a battleground blitz for President Trump with eight days to go, trying to out-travel his competitor, former Vice President Joe Biden, who is currently out-polling and outspending him. Today, Trump campaign manager Bill Stepien told reporters that he believes that President Trump's ground game chips away at any lead the Democrats have through early voting, suggesting the other side is leaving absentee votes on the table by not getting their candidate in front of more and bigger crowds. And there were large crowds, as you can see in Pennsylvania today. A state Trump's campaign notes is critical to any path it has to 270 electoral votes. Tomorrow, President Trump will campaign in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Nebraska. Wednesday, back to the Sun Belt. Trump said today, like an athlete, he's leaving it all on the field and criticized his rival's slimmer schedule. I thought it wasn't going to make it, but one thing, unlike Joe, where he goes into a basement, if he loses, and you know, who knows what, ha what happens, right? It's called an election. He should be ashamed of himself because he didn't work. One thing I did five, six, and sometimes seven of these in one day those last few days. Meanwhile, Trump's campaign is taking out $6 million in new ads across the Rust Belt, focusing on the economy and seniors. Jason Miller, Trump's senior advisor, said it will put them closer to parity with the Biden campaign that ended September, Shep, with $432 million to spend in the home stretch. Kayla Tauschi on the Trump campaign. Allie Vitale now with a look at Joe Biden's ground game in the final days. Allie? Shep, while Donald Trump has been blitzing these states, several states and several stops in a day, Joe Biden has not matched that pace out on the campaign trail. And it's something that has some Democrats hand-wringing, wondering if Biden should be out there campaigning more. It's something that the former vice president was asked about today during an impromptu stop in Chester, Pennsylvania. Listen to how he's saying why he's campaigning the way that he is. The big difference between us and the reason why it looks like we're not traveling. We're not putting on super spreaders. We are doing what we're doing here. Everybody's wearing a mask and trying as best we can to be socially distanced. 
Now, Shep, Pennsylvania, the state that Biden has spent more time in than any other this general election, but he's also adding some other key states to the mix this week. We know that he begins tomorrow in Georgia. That's a state that Democrats haven't won since 1992, but Democrats have been salivating over the chance to invest there and see if they can get it to flip in 2020, especially after they saw how close the 2018 governor's race was. Biden also making critical stops in places like Florida, Michigan, and Iowa and Florida this week in the home stretch. Those are the key states to the mix this week. We know that he begins tomorrow in Georgia. That's a state that Democrats haven't won since 1992. But Democrats have been salivating over the chance to invest there and see if they can get it to flip in 2020, especially after they saw how close the 2018 governor's race was. Biden also making critical stops in places like Florida, Michigan, and Iowa and Florida this week in the home stretch. Those are the ones we know about so far. But of course, it's the final week until the election. Anything can be added. Going to be a really busy few days for us out on the campaign trail here. No doubt, Ali Vitale. Thank you. The Senate is on track to vote in less than half an hour really to confirm Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the U.S. Supreme Court. Hallie Jackson's at the White House. And Hallie, t tell us about this ceremony that pr the president is planning to celebrate. Yeah, a ceremonial swearing in of Judge Amy Coney Barrett, presuming, of course, as is expected, that she ends up confirmed here in the next hour or so as Justice Barrett. There's going to be a big difference, Shep, between tonight's event and the one that you saw exactly one month ago today in the Rose Garden for Barrett's nomination. And you know what that difference is? Masks, Shep. This time, I'm told by a senior official that unlike the video you're looking at now, masks will be required for attendees who will be at the White House later on tonight. A primetime event for the president, but this is going to be a celebration for him, the third justice that he has gotten onto the Supreme Court here that has been confirmed by, of course, the Republicans in the Senate. Party line vote uh, expected for Amy Coney Barrett, but uh, of course, a, a big deal for President Trump, particularly in the closing days of a campaign, Shep. And Hallie, I mentioned the vice president moving forward with campaign events yeah. even after his staff tested positive for COVID. For regular people, everyday folks, that's against the guidelines, right? Right. You're not supposed to do that. If you, if, you, know, you or I or somebody ended up coming into close contact with somebody who tested positive, we'd have to go in quarantine for a little while. But if you are an essential worker, the CDC has different guidelines. So the vice president's office is saying, hey, he's an essential worker. That means he can still go and do the work of the campaign, as you were just looking at with the vice president in Minnesota, and take various precautions like for for example, Pence did, according to pool reporters with him, wear a mask on his way up to the stage. He took it off when he spoke. He put it back on when he went back. But you have to remember, Shep, the people who have now tested positive for COVID really are in Mike Pence's inner circle. It's four White House staffers plus an outside advisor. One of those staffers is his chief of staff, somebody who is extremely close to the vice president. He did, though, both he and Karen Pence tested negative for COVID today, Shep. Hallie Jackson, thank you. COVID watch and COVID deaths are mounting in America. We're now averaging close to 800 deaths per day, up 10% over just the past two weeks, according to Johns Hopkins. And cases continue to flare up. The country adding the largest seven-day surge during the entirety of this pandemic, more than 481,000 cases over the past week. And if you think you're safe in a rural small town, think again. Some of the states with the lowest populations, the Dakotas and Montana, they're now recording the highest number of cases per 100,000 over the past two weeks. The rural surge is real. No one is safe. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez on how South Dakota is dealing with the pandemic. Shep, COVID cases in at least 42 states were up at least 10% over the last two weeks. And the crisis is ravaging many smaller communities for the first time. For example, at this hospital in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, there are about 70 COVID patients in here right now. But hospital administrators say it's not the potential lack of bed space that worries them. They keep expanding their hospital to accommodate that. It's a potential staffing issues over the next few months. With having so much COVID within our community, we have a certain percentage of our nursing staff, our physician staff, all of our staff that are out either quarantining or sick with COVID. Winter is now here and we don't foresee the cases slowing down anytime soon unless people change their behaviors. Around the country, around 41,000 people are hospitalized. It's a, about a 40% jump in the last month. 130 lives would be saved by February. Hear that? 130,000 people are going to die who would not if we would all wear masks. That's from the scientists, but that's not happening. 
In Utah, COVID patients flooding ICUs. Doctors say they're now two-thirds full statewide, a few patients away from what they're calling unmanageable. In cases, Utah's increased 44% just this month, the most cases since the pandemic began. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald is live in Salt Lake City. Meg, Megan, how are hospitals there and across the state coping with this surge? You know, Chef, I think the short answer is, is day by day. But what I can tell you is that they're certainly sounding the alarm. Just last week, going to the governor to say, look, if the state continues on this trajectory of COVID-19 cases continuing to increase, they're going to have to start prioritizing patients. So what this means is, for example, if you have a younger patient and an older patient who have similar or equal uh, levels of illness, these health care providers will have to prioritize that younger patient. And of course, all of this taking an emotional toll on these doctors and nurses. I can tell you personally that I have been at the bedside of multiple patients of COVID-19 and been the last person that they saw, the last person to look at them in their eyes before they died. I have to do this sometimes multiple times a day. I have seen nurses walk out and say, I can't do this, but we have to. Who else is gonna do it? Yeah, a, a dire situation here in Utah. COVID-19 numbers uh, uh, hitting record levels. Last Friday, they saw nearly 2,000 new cases in just one day. We're seeing hospitals across the state overwhelmed, ICUs at or approaching capacity. All of this while healthcare workers, the governor, state officials are literally pleading with the public to do their part to try and stop the spread of this virus. Chef? Megan, thank you. CNBC's On The Money stocks plunged today. The Dow was off nearly 1,000, closed off 650, the worst day in almost two months. The S&P and NASDAQ a little better. S&P down almost 2%, NASDAQ lower by 1.6%. And the reason? Well, analysts are pointing to the record rate of new COVID cases, competing disaster relief, which is not happening, those bills stalled in the Congress, and the hoped-for economic recovery, anemic. Economists, the Fed, everyday Americans have been sounding the alarm for months. So why is Wall Street just taking notice today? Jim Kramer's with us, CNBC's Voice of the Investor. Jim, what spooked the markets today and why now? All right, well, first, Chef, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I think that what spooked people is that when you get certain numbers, they begin to think we're going to go back into lockdown. Yeah. But when we go back into lockdown, then there is a dramatic decline in, uh, in employment, and a dramatic decline in, in the amount of money that people have without a stimulus package. So I think there was, it was a logical, logical move. And for a moment, we forgot about the possibility of the vaccines around the corner. So, Shep, we got the bad and none of the good. Hmm. I, I wonder, though, this lack of a stimulus bill, this lack of disaster relief, is Wall Street now pricing that in, too? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, I think that there's a lot of people in Wall Street who would say, can we just accept the fact that there won't be a stimulus anything near term? But what we are really worried about is individual lockdowns. I know that there are a lot of people who want to go to bars and restaurants. A lot of people want to go out. Uh, and there's 14 million people involved in the hospitality industry. Those are the people and their families that are most directly impacted by the fact that there may not be a stimulus package. So if we see the shutdowns and we started seeing airline traffic go down again, we started seeing hotel, uh, the reservations are terrible. You're talking about 50 percent occupancy around the country. You know, Shep, that's not the way you can maintain any growth. Is there uncertainty within the markets on the election? Because I've heard you and so many on CNBC in the morning say that a Biden win is sort of priced in already. Is that right? I, I think a Biden win is priced in. I do not think a uh, Senate, the so-called blue wave, is priced in. If only because uh, people are just now beginning to get their arms around the idea that their capital gains, particularly wealthy people, since they, they're the ones that have capital gains, are, are their taxes are going to go up. But I've got to tell you, Chip, it, there was just kind of an overhang, uh, a, a kind of a belief that, you know what, Let's take some profits ahead of this election. Who knows if it's going to be a disputed election. These COVID numbers keep going up. I'm telling people, look, just stay the course. This is, we've seen worse. And I think that the fact that the fatality rate is low is somewhat reassuring, even as it is going up. I listened to what you had to say about masks. And boy, are you ever right. A lot of this is our own fault. Yeah, follow the Fauci. If we just all wear masks, if yeah. everyone would do it, 
I, you, you wonder why big business and big tech and Wall Street in general is pushing the rest of the country to say, if you wear it, we won't die. If you wear it, our economy will return. Well, Where are they? Honeywell's behind it, doing yep. the right thing. 3M, I'm seeing it from Walgreens. Under Armour, it's a groundswell. It's happening. You're right. They're going to fall in line. I promise you. It's great to be your post-game show. Thank you. I'm thrilled that you're coming. I'm thrilled to see you. I work with you at another point in my career, and you're every bit as great as then. And I thank you for all your kindness. Any group patience? group hug. Yeah. Good to we see could. you. We could. One day we will. One day. Thank, thank you, you, pal. Appreciate it. <laughs> wow. Strong winds fueling some flames in Southern California today. It is awful. The one they're calling the Silverado Fire doubled in size in just a matter of hours. We're live on the ground where fire officials are, officials are telling people to get out. And for many, this is all too familiar. A little burning ember falls on top. It will just slide right down the metal. One homeowner who lost everything to a wildfire builds a house that's not supposed to burn. Early voting shatters records. More than 60 million ballots already cast. How much does election day still matter? Plus, water on the sunny side of the moon. Why that could be a game changer. A fast-moving wildfire erupted in Southern California this morning, forcing about 70,000 people to evacuate on the fly. They call it the Silverado Fire. It's burning right now down in Orange County, south of Los Angeles. More than 500 firefighters battling the flames. Late word, at least two have been badly burned. That's from the county's fire authority. It just lit up this morning, and the powerful winds just exploded it and already scorched about 4,000 acres. NBC's Miguel Almagar is on the ground in Irvine tonight. Miguel, how's the progress there? Well, Chef, I got to tell you, it's a very precarious situation here. I've been covering, covering wildfires for the last 20 years, and I am shocked that not a single home or a subdivision, at least, has been destroyed by the flames here. The situation has been erratic on the weather front. You can see here, this is one of those hillside neighborhoods that's under threat at this very hour. There's about hundreds of homes out in this area. Firefighters and strike teams are trying to protect these hillsides. And you can see all the way down the block here, we have fire trucks that are standing by at the ready. Earlier today, there were wind gusts upwards of 96 miles an hour here in Southern California. That's the same strength as a Cat 2 hurricane. And those are the conditions firefighters are really battling against. It's starting these small spot fires and then quickly blowing them through entire communities here. As you mentioned, some 70,000 people have been forced to evacuate. That number could rise over the next 24 hours. This extreme wind event called the Santa Ana winds in Southern California and known as the devil or the Diablo winds in Northern California are expected to last for another 24 hours across this region. Power's been cut to about a million people. They're so concerned that those transmission lines could actually spark other wildfires. Again, the good news here, Shep, no major destruction in terms of homes lost, no lives have been lost, but two firefighters are also in critical condition. It's gonna be a long 24 hours as these nasty, nasty winds continue to kick upwards up in, in strength upwards of 80 to 90 miles an hour, Shep. Incredible, Miguel Almaguer, thanks so much. California winds fueling the flames. Meanwhile, winter weather in Colorado is really helping firefighters there. Look at this. Snow and cold temperatures slowing down at least. Two of the largest fires in state history. Al Roker's with us now. Lots of weather, Al. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, Shep. It's good to be on your program. And uh, uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Not only do we have the wildfires, but we've got another hurricane now that's developed. But let's talk about the wildfires. Fire danger for 33 million people right now. Gusty winds, low humidity continuing, not just for uh, California, but also into parts of Arizona, New Mexico, on into Colorado, and, uh, and also looking at Nevada as well for those winds and those conditions. In fact, talk about the winds. Strong wind advisories, high wind warnings, wind advisories for 27 million people. Mm. Scattered power outages, down trees, blowing objects. So those winds will be 
uh, fueling those wildfires and pushing them around. And in fact, the strongest wind guns, Shep, uh, are going to be in the Los Angeles area mountains. Again, tomorrow afternoon, 70 to 80 oh. mile per hour winds from Los Angeles into Palm Springs, south of Las Vegas. So uh, those winds are really going to fuel those fires. It'll only take a couple of embers. And boy, uh, those embers with these fire, these winds could blow as much as one to two miles away from their origin. So that's a big, big problem for firefighters. Oh, man, Al, they just cannot catch a break. And, and neither can the Gulf South. Louisiana, Mississippi are in the target zone again. Yeah, this is uh, hard to believe. Again, this system, Hurricane Zeta, has formed, uh, it's, it's a record breaker, forming about five weeks earlier than normal. The last time we had Zeta was in 2005. Right now we've got tropical storm watches and hurricane watches stretching from central Louisiana all the way to the Florida Panhandle Coast. Right now, Zeta is a Category 1 storm, 90 miles southeast of Cozumel, 80 mile per hour winds. It's moving northwest to 10, so it's going to hit the Yucatan Peninsula tonight, then back out into the Gulf. We're not expecting right now for it to strengthen because there's colder uh, water. There's also some wind shear. But tomorrow afternoon, we'll start to see rain all along the Gulf Coast from this. Makes landfall sometime, Shep, sometime late Wednesday night. New Orleans again in the that uh, cone of uncertainty, flooding rainfall, strong winds, a storm surge of anywhere from two to six feet. And mm. if you think, well, it's the Gulf Coast's problem, look at this. It races up into the mid-Atlantic and northeast on Thursday, bringing heavy rain and wind. The storm surges anywhere from two to six feet. And the rainfall, Shep, we're looking at anywhere from locally six inches of rain in the lower Mississippi River Valley. But as we widen out by Friday, heavy rain three to five inches stretching from the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys all the way into the mid-Atlantic and northeast, Shep. Man, it just <laughs> won't stop. Al Roker on weather from I'm home. I'm telling you. Well, Al, it's great to see you. Thank you. You too, my friend. All right, wildfires have destroyed more than 25,000 California homes in just the past three years. That number is from the government, and it doesn't even include the year 2020, everyone's favorite year. Some of these homeowners tell us, never again. But they're not moving away. These homeowners are trying to build houses that won't burn. Here's CNBC's Rahel Solomon. Watch as a firefighter tests this structure by lighting up piles of wood to simulate a wildfire. One side of the building is made of non-combustible siding, the other side, plain wood. And just 30 minutes in, the fire-resistant siding survives. The wood burnt to ash. Missy and David Barnard's house met a similar fate following a deadly blaze in Paradise, California. The 2018 inferno destroyed 12,000 homes, including theirs, but they made the decision to rebuild. And not only did they want non-combustible siding, they wanted the entire house to be fire resistant. So the way I describe it to people is kind of like a silo on its side, like a big metal arch. You know, when you're 51 years old and your whole idea of a house since you were a kid is this, you know, square box. It took me a minute to get used to. The unusual style is known as a Quonset hut. And according to designer Vern Sneed, the exterior material is 100% non-combustible. Most vulnerable part of a house is probably its overhang. I have eliminated the roof cavity completely so that there is nowhere for fire to get sucked into. A little burning ember falls on top. It will just slide right down the metal rather than sitting and smoldering. An added bonus, they're much faster to build than traditional houses. Barnard siding arrived in early October, installed by the next week, and the roof, a row of two dozen arches, lowered by crane two weeks later. We do all the hard work in the shop, and then it's just a matter of bolting everything together in the field. I think the biggest fire risk now is my neighbor's houses. <laughs> but some neighbors aren't risking it. Three more Paradise families, all victims of the fire, have been listed burned to build his unique flame-safe house for them. I have a feeling that our house is going to be like, you know, 50 years ago, uh, the groundbreakers and trendsetters made these super energy-efficient, non-combustible homes, and they're still standing perfectly. For the news, I'm Rahel Solomon. Love it. Well, a record-setting number of voters in Texas already. Millions of people lining up to cast their ballots. What's bringing people to the polls as former Vice President Joe Biden tries to turn that state blue? And the first battle against murder hornets is over.
And the people won. We'll show you the results. And you'll hear from the scientists who say the murder hornet war is just beginning. Urban cowboys rolling deep to get out the vote. And a cat desperately tries to keep one of his nine lives on a CNBC trip coast to coast. New York. A kitty cat jumps from a second floor window as flames close in. This is an apartment building in Harlem. The cat holds onto the ledge for as long as seems possible. There's smoke coming from his fur. Cops on the ground helpfully tell him to jump. Kitty finally lets go and tumbles to the ground. He's all better now with a new nickname, Tomcat. Maine. Forget Zoom. These Canadian newlyweds say they were determined to have their American friends and family at their wedding. So they got hitched on a pier between the two countries. To be my wife. Be my wife. The bride's grandparents watched from a boat docked in the St. Croix River. It separates New Brunswick from Callis, Maine. Love knows no borders. Florida. A night at the ballpark unlike any other. Since there's COVID, there's no minor league season. So the Blue Wahoos in Pensacola rent their oceanfront stadium on Airbnb. For 1500 bucks a night, kids can pitch from the mound, run the bases, and sleep in player bunks. California, Compton Cowboys saddling up to the polls. More than 50 riders on horseback spread the word about early voting, <laughs> dropping off their ballots and sailing into the sunset on this CNBC trip coast to coast. I'm Shepard Smith on CNBC. It's the bottom of the hour, time for the top of the news. Early voters turning out in droves with the election just eight days away. More than 60 million Americans have already voted. The NBC Decision Desk is now predicting early voting could hit 100 million people by Election Day. Long lines and spots across the country, including these New York City over the weekend. Two thirds of likely voters nationwide say they plan to cast their ballots before Election Day and about one-third say they'll vote in person on November the 3rd. That's data from our CNBC Change Research poll. In Texas, more than 7 million people have already voted. For context, it's about 82% of all the votes cast there in 2016. That's from the U.S. Election Project. NBC's Priscilla Thompson on the top story at the bottom of the hour with what she's hearing about voters in Texas. Shep, we are one week out from Election Day here in Texas, and both Democrat and Republican groups are on the ground working to turn out those last-minute voters. We spent time with the Congressional Leadership Fund. That is a Republican group on the ground here looking to get Republican voters who would not turn out otherwise to get out and vote. And on the flip side, we also spent time with the Texas Organizing Project, a Democratic group that is specifically targeting black and Latino voters who haven't historically voted in elections, but they're hoping can make the difference in this one. And, you know, we spoke with former Congressman Beto O'Rourke was out canvassing with that Democratic group today. And he says that with all the work going on on the ground here at the grassroots level, he'd like to see the top of the ticket make a visit. Take a listen to what he said. I want the top of the ticket to come here and and meet that voter and and encourage others in her family in her community and her neighborhood to turn out as well and this comes as more than 6.9 million texans have already voted in this upcoming election with still one week to go of early voting chef priscilla thanks president trump and joe biden both hitting the campaign trail in pennsylvania today the president narrowly won that state back in 2016, but with the polls showing him trailing by close to somewhere around 10 points, he's looking to keep this state red. CNBC's Brian Sullivan on a battleground state tour ahead of the election. He's live in Erie, PA tonight. Hey, Brian. Hey, Chef. Yeah, listen, if the candidates could not be different enough, I mean, they are campaigning in very different ways. Trump speaking three times in Pennsylvania today, Joe Biden making a surprise appearance out as well. Biden hammering the COVID strategy, saying the president has mishandled that. The president, though, sort of downplaying COVID, as you know, talking more up on the economy. Now, you reference the CNBC change research polls. Well, right now, it is the economy, not by much, by a neck, 
that is top of mind on Pennsylvania voters. About 45% saying that's their key issue there, although you can see the lines coming in. More people may be worried about COVID as the case numbers grow. Fewer now worried about the economy, but the economy, Shep, still top of mind. Trump hammering that every step that he gets in this key of all Keystone states. I'll say Brian Sullivan in Erie, PA, thanks. We clearly have two divergent campaign strategies for President Trump and former Vice President Biden. The president's game plan be highly visible. Since the beginning of October, President Trump has held 25 events in 12 states, large rallies without much social distancing. But Joe Biden, a much more limited public schedule during the pandemic, holding 18 much smaller public events in eight states. In the COVID era, one candidate, very cautious, and the other, not so much. And according to two political strategists on the brand, and the right plan for each of them. People want a responsible president, and they can see by Joe Biden not participating in huge rallies, by being socially distant, by wearing a mask. Again, it's not just a smart strategy to keep the country safe, it's also smart politics. The Trump campaign is kind of stuck. They're behind in the polls and they're running out of time, so they need to change it up and try to make it about the economy, and big rallies are their favorite tool. They're not as worried about being criticized over COVID because they're already losing that issue to Biden. So what are voters thinking about these two very different strategies? Let's get back to Pennsylvania, the battleground of all battlegrounds. Steve Kornacki now, how, how close exactly is this there? Yeah, it's Shep, it is, this is the key one, really, for the president. He needs to hang on to this state. For Joe Biden, this could be a decisive win if he gets it. The average of all the polls in Pennsylvania right now puts Biden ahead of Trump by five points. What's interesting is you take a look here. This was 2016. This is how Trump pulled off Pennsylvania. And I just show you quickly here, this in particular, Philadelphia and the Philadelphia suburbs, this is where Democrats believe they've made their biggest gains, that they stand to make their biggest gains. Hillary Clinton won these counties outside Philadelphia in 2016, but Democrats think they're going to get a much bigger margin, potentially much bigger turnout here. Again, the margin in the state was less than a point for President Trump. It's places like Scranton mm. in 2016 where he improved on how Republicans normally do. They think they can run up the score there. They can run up the score in southwest Pennsylvania. But it really is sort of a Philadelphia suburbs versus the more rural parts of the state, some of the older, smaller cities in the state. Uh, those are the two coalitions that are kind of at odds here. So that's Pennsylvania. Let's talk Texas for a second. You know, I'm reading this new poll that came out in the Dallas Morning News yesterday. The, the Democrats are clearly, clearly trying to turn that state blue, but is that at all realistic? It, it's not totally unrealistic when you look at this. This is the poll average in Texas right now. Donald Trump leads, but it's only by four points. This has been the trend in Texas, by the way. In 2012, Mitt Romney, the Republican, won Texas by 16 points. In 2016, Donald Trump won it by nine, and now it's down to four in the polling. So the trend has been moving towards Democrats. And you just get a look here. This was Trump. This was 2016. This was how he won the state. Where Democrats think they're making the gains, though, the Dallas area, the Austin area, the Houston area, the San Antonio area, the metro areas of the state, fast growing, politically changing in the Trump era. The Democrats think they could be on the cusp of something there, whether this is actually the year it tips or they just get tantalizingly close. That's what we'll see. Kornacki, thank you. You got it. COVID watch now and a frankly frightening surge in El Paso. Hospitals there are so overwhelmed that patients are being airlifted to other cities in some cases. A curfew has just been put in place. So how bad in the days ahead? A doctor on the front lines joins us. And fatigue turns into fury in Italy. Cases of COVID are rising, restrictions are tightening. Italians, many of them now fed up. The revolt in Italy, next. Well, Texas is now tied with California for the most COVID-19 cases in all the country. That's according to the latest figures from NBC News. And I want to focus on El Paso for a moment, where they have record numbers, more than 10,000 in the past two weeks, the most for any county in the whole state. 
A 200% rise in hospitalizations. Intensive care units reported to be at capacity. City officials have issued a curfew now. Residents required to stay home from 10 o'clock at night till 5 in the morning unless they're essential. Violators face center being turned into a field hospital. Dr. Ogachika Alozi is with us. He sits on the Texas Governor Abbott's COVID task force. He's the chief medical officer at Del Sol Medical Center. Doctor, describe if you could for us what it's like in your hospital. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I think what we would best describe it as is organized chaos. Well, we're lucky being an HCA system, but in terms of PPE and supplies, we're doing great. But as you understand, with over 200 medical personnel being in our hospitals and the fact that those numbers are going up so rapidly, it's really concerning what the next four to six weeks really have in play. Hey, are you getting the support you need? Are the, is the personnel coming in? Do you have the equipment you need? Oh, definitely. So again, as part of the HCA network, we have a huge supply chain. And so we're not worried in terms of supplies, equipment, the things we need. We're bringing in physicians, nurses specifically. Those are the real people that are driving the care that we're able to give in the hospital. Doctor, do you have a sense for why this is happening and why now? Is there something specific to your community or do you know? We're not really sure. So if we look at the city numbers, Part of it is gatherings, a lot of family gatherings. Mm -hmm. We're a very family-oriented city, multi-generational homes where children, an adult, and even a grandparent live in the same home. I think 79938, which is one of our zip codes, is actually one of the most populated zip codes in America. And you have to remember that we are on the border. Juarez just closed down their city over the weekend, and they're going to go into a 14-day shutdown. So multifactorial, we can't really pinpoint it, but I think the important thing is for people to understand that irrespective of the numbers, they're human beings, those are lives. And yeah. so we kind of get lost in the 1,000 cases, 10,000 cases, but that's the 20-year-old that got intubated in our ICU or a patient that came in the other day in their 50s was asking for a cup of Sprite prior to getting intubated. That may be his last wish. And oh. so people have to remember, those numbers are just numbers. It's human tragedy and we need to work together as a community to improve it. Dr. Alozi, before we go, I know as medical professionals you have to plan ahead. As you plan ahead for the next two, three, four weeks, what are you seeing? I think that the community and the country needs to realize that this is just the beginning of what could be a dark and tragic time over the next four to six weeks. We understand that cases beget hospitalizations which beget tragically deaths and so as we're working with our city authorities, our community, and the hospital partners, as well as FEMA and the governor, we're really focused on getting the supplies we need to keep as many people safe and alive as possible. I bet you're begging people to follow the Fauci and wear the masks. No, oh, totally, totally. I mean, I think we, we should be way past the conversation of mask, physical distance, stay at home. But again, any yeah. time that we can reiterate it, I think it's critically important. Follow the Fauci, Dr. Ogachika Alozi. It's great of you. Thank you. As, COVID, as the COVID pandemic first started spreading early this year, Europe gave us clues to our sort of COVID future in America, remember? Same's true right now. And parts of Europe are reeling. Wales starting a 17-day lockdown over the weekend, closing bars and pubs. Health officials say the number of COVID patients in hospitals in Wales is now the highest since June. The Czech Republic has banned movement of people entirely to curb the spread of COVID. That's according to the health minister there. It now has the highest, second highest per capita death rate in all the world over the weekend. Then there's Spain declaring a national state of emergency, imposing a nighttime curfew for at least 15 days, but warning it could go up to six months, depending on how things go. Spain, of course, was the first country in Europe to pass one million COVID cases. And then there's Italy, a disturbing rise in infections now. Its daily COVID number over the past week, nine times higher than at the start of this month. NBC's Bill Neely is in Milan. Yeah, hi, Shep. A very different Italy tonight. Very quiet because from 6 o'clock tonight, all bars, cafes and restaurants right across Italy had to close their doors. And that's the way it's going to stay. It had been that it could stay open until 11 o'clock now. Every night at 6, they have to shut. And that's hundreds of thousands of businesses right across this country. Many people protesting at the weekend, unhappy about this because they think their livelihoods 
are endangered. So there were scuffles, small protests in Rome and Naples over the weekend. But it's not just restaurants and cafes. Gyms and movie theatres will close. Religious services are being restricted. Sporting events too. Basically all sporting events are off except professional events like soccer, which will take place behind closed doors. The reason for all of this, record numbers of daily new coronavirus cases. They're averaging about 20,000 new cases a day. At the start of the month, it was about 2,000 new cases a day. Uh, the health system is buckling. Hospitals are beginning to be overwhelmed. People are scared because it's not just here in the north, and Milan is the epicenter. It's now right across Italy that COVID cases are increasing. The only good news is that so far, deaths are not at the level that they were at at the spring. But I'm afraid, Shep, in Italy, the second wave is sweeping across and history is in danger, tragically, of repeating itself in the most deadly way. Shep? Oh, Bill, thank you. A historic vote in South America, plus a major storm hits the Philippines as we go round the world in 80 seconds. The Philippines, a typhoon ripping through the country. Officials say the storm displacing more than 25,000 people. Crews rescuing five fishermen, at least eight still missing. 112 mile an hour winds knocking out power and tearing roofs off homes. Falling trees and other debris injuring dozens. First responders are now working to save more people from flooded villages. Chile, the country voted to rewrite the Constitution. Thousands of people crowded the streets of Santiago and celebrated with fireworks and music. Officials say it was the highest voter turnout in more than 30 years. The late dictator General Augusto Pinochet drafted the current Constitution. That vote happened during a time when political parties were banned. Venezuela, Jesus, take the wheel. This church near Caracas transforms its parking lot into a drive-in mass. Dozens of parishioners honk and wave during the ceremony while this priest delivers communion through their car windows, keeping a tradition alive during dark times. China, Tianzu Mountain, or Heavenly Pillar, becoming a racetrack. But these daredevils hitting top speeds of more than 60 miles an hour flying down winding roads on long boards and roller skates as we go round the world in 80 seconds. Judge Amy Coney Barrett, moments away from becoming Justice Barrett. We had thought that by now they might be voting, but as you can see, Mitch McConnell is speaking and they're still in the discussion phase in this live look on the Senate floor. The vote will be happening shortly, we're told. Amy Coney Barrett has important cases coming her way, cases with real consequences. Pete Williams on those next. Plus, seek and destroy the mission to take out the murder hornets. How scientists won a battle in the war. Coming up. A live look in Washington coming. And uh, Mitch McConnell still speaking on the Senate floor with a confirmation vote for Judge Amy Coney Barrett expected in just a few minutes. Of course, the outcome is not in doubt. Tomorrow, we will have a new Supreme Court. Six conservatives and three liberals. So what are the first big cases before the justice, and how might this solidifying of the conservative majority have an impact on our lives? Here's NBC's justice correspondent, Pete Williams. Shep, Justice Barrett won't be able to vote on any of the cases that have already been argued, the ones in October, but she can vote on four hot-button cases that will be in her inbox when she arrives at the Supreme Court tomorrow. Three are emergency appeals from presidential battleground states on whether to extend the deadline for accepting mail ballots that come in after Election Day. Democrats have said that the pandemic and a postal service slowdown mean that some voters could be disenfranchised if their ballots get stuck in the mail. Two of these cases come from Wisconsin and North Carolina. In the third, Pennsylvania Republicans lost on a four to four vote in the Supreme Court a week ago, seeking to roll that deadline back. Now they're trying again, clearly hoping that Justice Barrett will give them a fifth vote. The other big case is President Trump's appeal of lower court orders requiring his accountants to turn over his tax returns to a New York grand jury. If the Supreme Court says no, it's game over for the president, and New York DA Cyrus Vance would get the documents that the president has tried so hard to keep away from prosecutors. Shep? Pete Williams, thank you. Murder hornets. <laughs> the giant orange and bluish black insects that come from Asia 
and left unchecked can potentially wipe out honeybees in North America. It's very serious. But score one for the scientists. For the first time, agriculture agents found and destroyed an entire nest over the weekend. Almost 100 murder hornets. Now, we actually thought that those murder hornets were dead, but apparently they were just knocked out and have now been revived in captivity for testing and studying. So the murder hornets live. None of this was easy. Scientists have been trying to find the nest for weeks now, struggling to attach these tiny trackers to their bellies so they could locate their hives where some two-inch long queen murder hornet holds court over all the captive murder hornets. It's all a tall order in a race against time because come winter, murder hornets hibernate and then they'll come out to destroy in the spring. CNBC's Contessa Brewer on how scientists finally found and took out murder hornets lair. Suited up like stormtroopers standing on scaffolding, scientists in Washington state had to whack the tree to get the murder hornets to budge from their nest. Finding this first nest was no easy feat. First, scientists set all kinds of traps to capture the invasive insects. We're going to try tagging a hornet. And tested tiny tracking devices on domestic hornets. Once they captured a live murder hornet, they attached the radio sensor. We're going to hope the hornet does what hornets do, which is to fly home. It led them right back to its nest on a vacant house lot in Blaine, Washington up 10 feet in a hole in a tree. It wasn't underground like these nests are normally in Asia. They're already exhibiting different behavior. Workers wrapped the tree in cellophane and foam to block any unseen exits and then vacuumed 85 live hornets out of the nest. Feisty workers that survived their capture. Then the team pumped carbon dioxide into the nest mm -hmm. to kill any remaining hornets, sprayed foam over the entire tree with plans to cut it down and to analyze the nest for the newborns and to check for a queen. We were never once attacked by the hornets. This is just the beginning of a war on murder hornets. Keep fighting these battles until we have eradicated Asian giant hornets, uh, if that's possible. Now look, there have been other sightings of murder hornets in the same region, but far enough from this particular nest to indicate a different nest or two. So scientists are on the hunt for the next one. They're hoping to save those bees under siege, Shep. <laughs> Contessa Brewer, thanks so much. There's water on the moon. And not only in the shade, huge implications for a mission to Mars. Pope Francis making history, naming the first African-American cardinal, Wilton Gregory, Archbishop of D.C. He's a progressive, originally from Chicago, just like Pope Francis. He tried to reform the church during the massive sex abuse scandal. Some Catholics said he didn't go far enough. Made headlines criticizing the president over that photo op at a church in Washington. Pope Francis set to elevate Archbishop Gregory next month. There's water on the sunny side of the moon. That's from NASA, where scientists are reporting it could be a game changer. They originally thought the water, or ice really, was limited to the moon's colder, shadowy regions, but researchers found that water could actually be trapped in little pockets all over the moon. A game changer is this. If there's enough water, NASA could use the moon as a base for space travel. Astronauts could mine ice there, or even make rocket fuel. 55 seconds left on a race to the finish. Officials order at least 70,000 people to evacuate in Southern California. Fast-moving wildfire exploded in size near Irvine. Two firefighters seriously hurt and in hospital with bad burns. Voting underway now on the Senate floor to confirm Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. President says there'll be a ceremony later tonight. Senior White House official says masks will be required this time around. The Dow is sinking almost 1,000 points before closing down 650 as coronavirus cases hit frightening new highs all across the country. And now, you know the news. For this Monday, October 26, 2020, I'm Shepard Smith. Follow us on Twitter, at The News on CNBC. And don't forget, follow the Fauci. If we wear our masks, as many as 130,000 fewer people will die, will die by February. So wear the mask! <laughs>